The alarm wakes us each morning to the same story. Parts of the federal government are once again shut down. President Trump and Democratic leaders in Congress are wide apart over funding for a border wall. The day unfolds with the scriptwriters perhaps adding a few new elements, an Oval Office address or a trip to the Mexican border by the president, Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer trooping out of the White House to denounce him. But the next day we wake up and nothing has changed. So how does this movie end? Well, so far both sides seem confident that they're winning, or at least they're not losing. This is in part because the shutdown hasn't yet hurt the country that much. Trash may be piling up in national parks, but to those of us who live in big cities, that kind of looks like a normal day. And it's unlikely that the nation seems about to rise up and demand that the employees of the Internal Revenue Service be reinstated, especially now that the administration has said the tax refunds the agency sends out at this time of year won't be affected by the shutdown. But unloved as it may be, the federal bureaucracy does perform important functions. Sooner or later, perhaps when lines at airports grow intolerably long, as security personnel don't show up for work, or when farmers miss the payments the government has promised them to compensate for China's trade tariffs, for example, voters will get restive. When that happens, who gets the blame will depend on what you really think is at stake in this fight. The Democrats insist this wall is all political posturing. There's no real emergency out there, and this is only about a president determined to make good on a campaign promise. The president insists the standoff is about the vital national security interests of the country. The wall is the way to stop the inflow of criminals, illegal immigrants and drugs. But to the president and his supporters, the wall is also the prime symbol of an America vigorously standing up for its own people against outsiders. It's a larger picture. It's a concrete or maybe steel barrier that poses the question, are you for America first or are you just part of that squishy global crowd who care as much or even more about Central American migrants as you do about West Virginia coal miners. Whoever prevails in this standoff, you can expect that to be a key message in the president's bid for re-election next year. Well, to discuss all that and the broader issues facing America's security is Michael Chertoff. He was America's second Secretary of Homeland Security and is now co-founder and the executive chairman of the Chertoff Group, which advises companies on security and risk management. He's also author of a new book, Exploding Data, Reclaiming Our Cybersecurity in the Digital Age. Mr. Chertoff, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Let me start thank by asking, if I may, thank you, uh, the, about the uh, current situation with the wall. Um, should the president, can the president and should he um, use emergency powers uh, if there isn't going to be a deal with Congress to get this wall finished? So I'm sure there are lawyers all over this. I have to say I'm, I have some doubts about emergency powers in this context. But that will wind up being litigated in the courts if, in fact, the president does this. The sad thing is this. There actually is an agreement that could be reached very easily if you're really focused on what produces results. And that would be a comprehensive package of border security, technology, additional judges to adjudicate the asylum claims, more space to house people who need to be housed, and you can have some infrastructure as part of that. But to make the whole thing about the wall is to be symbolic and performative rather than practical and result-oriented. So let's just, uh, I want to come on to some of those other points you raised and what could be done. But, um, you know, one possibility the president's been talking about, the, has been reported, is that there could be funds used for the Army Corps of Engineers, which uh, is part of the federal, you know, to, uh, federal emergency management to, you know, build dikes and levees and things like that. They could be, money could be diverted from there to build the wall. What would you think of that? Well, that, the problem there is what the Army Corps is doing is literally protect us against the next storm. We've had a couple of really bad storms in the last year. If you don't start to shore up uh, and make repairs, you're going to have people lose property and lives that could have been prevented. So again, that is sacrificing real important missions for symbolic and performative activity. The president, though, says, and back to your point about what, what, needs, what could be done, the president said, says walls work. Walls do prevent people coming in. They're the most effective physical barrier to stop people. Look at the wall that uh, uh, Israel built and the, um, the, how effective that has been. Um, why is that not right? Why is a physical wall actually not really the best way to do so, this? So when I was in office, we built 700 miles of barriers. <clears throat> and there are areas where I will tell you absolutely barriers are important. They don't keep people out, but they slow them up and they allow them to be intercepted. But where you have, for example, hundreds of miles of mountains, a wall is ridiculous. Where you have a broad, wide river, a wall is unnecessary. So again, as part of a package, 
that looks at technology, personnel, detention facilities. Some wall is useful, but it's not all about the wall. And the irony is this. The humanitarian crisis we're facing now, and it's genuine, involves people going to the ports of entry. The wall has nothing to do with that. So you do agree with the president that we do face a crisis? I do think we have a, a crisis. The problem really begins, however, in the Northern Triangle in this hemisphere. People are running for their lives. And when they're fleeing for their lives, the uh, barrier is not going to stop them. So the real answer here, for example, is not to cut foreign aid. It's actually to work with countries in Central America to create a more stability, more of a rule of law, and then those people won't want to come because they'll be safe at home. But isn't though the part of the uh, what's going on is that people are, are attracted to come to the United States for economic reasons, and the economy is strong, the employment situation is very strong, uh, and they you know they want to come and work here, and many of them may be refugees, but we have huge number of illegal I mean, immigrants here who are here for economic reasons. You always have that, although I would say in the last year or two, the balance has shifted away from pure economic migrants, partly because, ironically, the economy is getting better, for example, in Mexico, and move towards people who are genuinely afraid for their lives. I heard a story yesterday about a woman who was sick here who had come from uh, someplace in Central America and got a call from a gang, and they said, we have your son here. We want money. She said, I, I have no money to give you. They said, fine, we're going to start cutting his fingers off, and she heard them do that. Now, that is going to force you to flee mm. uh, wherever you can go. Is there a problem, the president has talked about terrorism and about drugs, and again, these problem of opioids in particular, uh, this is a terrible scourge in the United States uh, right now. Would a wall be effective uh, in dealing with that? And if not, what, what would? Again, that's not how most of this comes in. People aren't, you know, carrying drugs across the mountain range. What they're doing is they're smuggling it in through ports of entry. They may be coming by sea. They may be shipping. Those are the areas where the bulk of this is happening. So the ability to detect it using technology and intelligence collection, again, maximizes the value of what you're trying to secure. You were Secretary of Homeland Security at a time when terrorist threats were a daily reality uh, for Americans just a, a few years ago. Again, what about the terrorism threat? Uh, we, we've seen these figures that you know large numbers of terrorists are apprehended, but they're generally apprehended at, uh, or, or I should not say terrorists, but people on, on the no-fly list or potential terrorists, but they're apprehended at airports, not through the walls. Is, the, is, is that not a threat for us, for, for the, the potential terrorists? Uh, well, we're always worried about terrorists or criminals coming in. But as you point out, the vast majority come through ports of entry, usually airports. Uh, to the extent we've had a history of seeing terrorists come through a land port of entry, it actually was from, from Canada. And even then, they don't sneak across the border on foot. They come in cars and they try to pretend to be legitimate people. So, I mean, I'm not saying wall doesn't perform a function, but in the hierarchy of things you need, it's kind of low on the list.